So, Steve, the floor is yours. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about some of our team's work on cognitive computing. Uh, so we're a, a pretty broad team spread across three continents. Uh, I'm talking to you from San Jose, California today. Um, and really what our main interest with cognitive computing is, is to uh, develop electronic neuromorphic machine technology that scales to biological levels. Uh, and basically what that means in very simple language is that we want to build a brain-like computer in, in a box. Um, so why would you want to do this, uh, this sort of thing? Well, I have a, a very simple example just to sort of demonstrate this. I'm going to show you three uh, pictures fairly quickly. And just by show of hands, raise your hand if you recognize these. So, uh, Alan, if you can just click through the next three slides. Maybe about a second on each. Okay, so I think we maybe missed one in there, but that's fine. Uh, the point I want to make is that probably I could have shown you one of millions of different pictures here and you would have had very little trouble recognizing what it is. Probably in less than a second, you could tell me what, what that picture was. Uh, moreover, as you heard earlier, the brain can do this sort of thing using about as much power as a light bulb, and it fits basically in a shoebox. Uh, there's been some fantastic work getting traditional computers to do this sort of thing, yet they still can only recognize a fraction of what your brain can recognize and require much, much more power to do so. Uh, so our hope is that if we can build computers that draw inspiration from how the brain works, they might become much more efficient and much better at these sorts of brain-like tasks that we so excel at. Um, so what we're doing going forward is uh, we started about five years ago uh, on this task, and we realized from the very beginning this was going to be an extremely difficult challenge. So the brain is the most complicated system that we know of in the universe. It has about as many processing elements as there are stars in the galaxy. Uh, yet still, scientists over the past several decades have done a lot of good work figuring out how the brain works, what the pieces are, how they fit together, uh, and, and so on. Um, so what we're doing basically is trying to take those pieces, take that information that uh, neuroscience has given us, and figure out how to build a chip with it. So about two years ago, we had our first big success. I don't know how well you can see this, but this chip here, this is, it might look like a normal computer chip, but it's actually fundamentally different from anything you would find in any laptop, any cell phone, or any other electronic device today. And that's because the guts of this chip, basically, the internals, are designed as digital versions of the same processing units that we have in our brain. And this being our first effort, it's a relatively small chip. So this chip, it's roughly at the scale of a worm's brain. So a worm, you can think of what it does. It crawls around, it maybe eats some food, but it doesn't do very much. It's a fairly simple organism. Uh, yet still, we're able to program this chip, basically, to do a few interesting things, one of which is to play a game. Um, so some of the older people in the audience may recognize this game. It's a version of Pong, which is one of the first video games ever created. And basically what we're doing here is we've taken this chip, we can connect it by a USB port actually to any other computer, and so we have a computer playing this game of Pong. And then the chip basically watches this, uh, this game board through a virtual camera. It then makes predictions about where that ball is moving, and then sends commands to that paddle to move it back and forth to keep the ball bouncing around. And this is essentially the same way that you would play the game, just by watching it, making predictions, and then sending out motor commands to, uh, to move that back and forth. So the, uh, I think the big question then is, how exactly are, are we doing this? Uh, well, you've probably heard of neurons before. So neurons are basically uh, specialized cells in our body. Uh, so just like we have uh, blood cells and skin cells and so on, we also have these brain cells, which are, which are neurons. And what they do is actually fairly simple. They generate messages, which are simply the pulses, sometimes called spikes, that basically say there's something interesting happening here at a particular time. Uh, now, just as a neuron is sending out these messages, it's also receiving messages from other neurons. Uh, typically, the more messages it receives, the more it in turn sends out. And finally, each neuron can receive messages from many, many other neurons. Uh, 
And what it does then is it's able to, therefore, integrate information. Uh, so for, as a really simple example, you could imagine maybe one neuron responds anytime you see the color white, another anytime you feel cold, and another anytime you taste vanilla. So you could have a fourth neuron that then puts this information together and says whenever these three are active at the same time, then it means you're probably eating vanilla ice cream, most likely. And in reality, you don't just have, you know, three neurons feeding into another one. Uh, each neuron typically listens to about 10,000 other neurons. Uh, and moreover, you don't just have a few of these in your brain. You have 20 to 100 billion operating in parallel. So what each neuron does is actually relatively simple. But because you have so many of them operating simultaneously, you get some really, really powerful, interesting functions. Um, so what we've done basically with our work is to, to draw from neuroscience, uh, who, who basically, uh, so scientists have done a lot of work saying, how is it that a neuron works? What you know, mathematical equations govern this sort of message sending and receiving behavior? And we've built digital circuitry that essentially does the same thing. Uh, and that's this chip that you, that you saw here. And uh, what that lets us do then is basically do more uh, brain-like tasks in a much more efficient way than traditional computers can achieve. So now, looking, to, uh, looking at how we actually make this happen, uh, we have a very, very diverse team of people here, a very broad set of skills making this all possible. Um, so, uh, Alan, if you can go, I think, one more slide ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. So this is the team that's, that's been doing this work. Uh, at the bottom, you can see the different skill sets that we bring to bear on this. I basically just want to make the point here that it's a, a really broad range of things that we need to make this happen. So we have, uh, we have chemists in our team, we have cognitive scientists, we have mathematicians, uh, we have people to do software development, we have uh, product designers. Uh, really no single person can, can make this sort of project a reality. And now looking to the future, we have a lot of exciting ideas for where this might go. So the chip I showed, it has, uh, like I said, about the scale of a worm brain. But by using simulations of the same basic technology, we can now look to see where we might go in the future. Uh, what you're seeing here is a simple system we built to do speaker recognition. That is, we play audio from someone talking, we show video of the person's face, and the system's able to identify who that particular person is. We also have uh, another system we built. This one's kind of just for fun. Uh, it's a system where we can show it sheet music from different, different artists, uh, different composers, and it can actually, just by looking at the style that you see in that sheet music, tell you who composed the piece. Uh, so, Alan, if you can go to the, the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So, what you'll see here is, uh, I think this is an example of us distinguishing between Bach and Beethoven. Uh, and again, basically the system's just able to look at, you know, stylistic uh, things from each of these composers and sort of pick out who did what. And this is the sort of thing that uh, humans are actually relatively good at once they get to know a particular composer. They can very quickly just point out certain things that are indicative of who wrote the piece. And then finally, looking even further to the future, we, uh, we're starting to kind of just play around with different ideas for what we could do next. So we have uh, product designers who are uh, putting together little uh, samples of what we, what we think we could do with this technology. Um, so one of them is, uh, Alan, if you can go to the next slide, please. It's uh, these little devices here. I don't know how well you can see these. But basically, they're little cameras where we think we can put uh, a chip inside a box of about this size with a tiny little camera. And then we could specialize these chips to recognize different things. So this one, uh, it's designed to recognize a person's face. Uh, we have another one, maybe you could recognize a car with this one. And then we have some ideas. You can maybe even connect these things together and allow the two chips inside to talk. So that way you could detect you know, both a face and a car. So maybe you're looking for a person inside of a car when you connect them together. Uh, so uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. Uh, another possibility we're thinking about is because these things are so, so low power, it would be easy to distribute them around the environment. And that gives you possibilities to do things like environmental monitoring. We have that jellyfish idea where we could have a device that would just float in the ocean and it could tell you things about, you know, uh, ocean salinity, temperature, wave height. It could maybe give warnings if tsunamis are occurring or if there's environmental troubles. Um, then we have another idea for, again, because this chip is so lightweight yet, uh, and low power, 
you could potentially mount it in a device like this uh, that could help uh, blind people to see, for example, by helping them understand the environment better and make sense of it. So <clears throat> at this point, uh, we think there's a lot, of, a lot of different possibilities going forward. And I'll just end by saying uh, we think we're, we're very excited about where this is going to go. And that we're basically only limited by our creativity at this point as far as what we can actually do with a device like this. Okay, well, thank you.